Hello and welcome again. This is The Human Condition and I'm Michael Pierce. The uh, section we're doing today is Chapter 9, Clinical Correlation of the course uh, EEG and ERP for Complementary Alternative and Functional Medicine Practitioners, their patients, and their technicians. When we do clinical correlation, we are correlating complementary and alternative medicine. And so that means that we have to really look at um, er everything, including the lifestyle, the family history, the dynamics in the family. We have to look at the counseling that may be going on. We have to look at the financial history of the family and the patient. We have to look at the workup that's been done, prior workup, prior imaging, like x-rays or MRIs or dental scans, uh, dental x-rays. We have to look at blood labs and other labs like urine, fecal tests, saliva tests. There may be uh, gene tests like SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, mutations. So we really need to, to do a complete correlation with everything. And I think the most important part is to correlate with other practitioners. What I like to do is sit down with the, the practitioners and say, okay, given the entire case, what do you think is most important given that you represent one discipline and you're sitting around the table with other doctors like a dentist, an acupuncturist, a chiropractor, a functional neurologist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and a nurse practitioner, maybe even a gynecologist or a physical therapist might be there or an, or an occupational therapist, all of which I've worked with. So we need to ask each person if they think that their discipline is most important at that moment or if somebody else's discipline is. And it's really cool when you're sitting around the table to have everybody vote and say, you know, what is the priority right now and why do you think it's the priority and have each discipline chime in on that. So correlating all of the clinical work is extremely significant. Now, one of the things that I've been asked a lot is what are the conditions that respond to brainwave measurement and brainwave training? versus, um, say, functional neurology rehab. So with functional neurology exam and rehab, these are the patients that are typically a little more nuts and bolts pathway, and, and meaning a lot more physical manifestations. They are the patients, the patients that need a chiropractic neurology exam and customized neuro rehab exercises are problems that are a little bit more physical in nature. They might be double vision, nausea, vomiting, falling, vertigo, dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, stumbling, tripping, crashing into things, lack of coordination, weakness, numbness, paresthesia, which is a false feeling. Um, it might involve headaches. It might involve dysautonomia where they, they notice that they get suddenly cold or hot or sweaty in different parts of their body or, or asymmetric sweat, one side versus the other. They might notice weakness of their face or, or maybe stroke-like symptoms or pseudo-stroke. They might notice things like gout or pseudo-gout. So all these different problems might involve a little bit slightly more physical symptoms, although they can be brain and nerve related. In many cases, their localization is much more subcortical and brainstem and, and cerebellar, although certainly these patients can, can and do respond well to examination of the cortex of the lobes of the brain. There is a place for lobes of the brain work uh, in concert with EEG and ERP and uh, neurofeedback training, Q QEG and S. Loretta-based um, assessment and training. There are brain exercises that can be done for the temporal lobes and for the, the occipital lobes and parietal lobes and frontal lobes. And so psychologists that do neurofeedback for the lobes of the brain and the limbic system need to be aware that there are rehab exercises that are activations of the brain that will help bring blood flow to that area. In fact, a lot of, of psychologists are just beginning to learn that alpha overflow of the, the low alpha edge of alpha peak frequency may indicate uh, ischemia, and they will use neurofeedback to try to, to wake up that part of the brain and bring activation back, but they have to be very careful. Now, functional neurologists are trained, chiropractic neurologists are trained to do just that. They're trained to identify the fatigability of a certain brain region and tune into that Goldilocks region of enough activation versus not enough activation to make there be the right amount of stimulus to that brain region and to test it, not only the brain region directly for what you're working on, but the autonomic support and the vascular watershed, if you will, the blood supply of that area too, to look for dysautonomia in that area of the brain or of the brain stem or the cerebellum or the face or, or the, the arm or the leg. So it's, it's really important to work together and understand that. Now, conversely, the question might be, well, what are the types of things that respond 
more to brainwave measurement and QEG and neurofeedback and S. Loretta and infraslow fluctuation. These are ones that they tend to be a little more emotional, although there's a lot of crossover. So um, while migraine headaches and headaches are certainly crossover, dysautonomia is a crossover, there's a lot of things that are crossover. Generally, things that are a little more psychological tend to be what we do these brainwave things instead of, say, functional rehab. Although we'll still do both on a lot of them. Depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, personality disorders, individuals who have oppositional defiant disorder, autism spectrum disorders, and dyslexia, the neurobehavioral disorders of childhood. All of these systems can benefit from both functional neurology rehab and from brainwave neurofeedback training. So it's useful to, to understand that some offer a little bit more uh, assessment and, and treatment, bang, and some offer a little less, but it, certainly a combination is very, very useful, and both of them really, really require a metabolic assessment. If a person has a metabolic um, uh, deficit in, in some kind of pathway where they're uh, hyperinflammatory or they are deficient in essential nutrients or some pathway is uh, impaired from a combination of SNPs, we're not talking about just a single SNP like the MTHFR gene. We're talking about a confluence, an orchestra, a, a, a symphony of genes working together. And if these genes don't work together well, and a person has received a, a bunch of, of mutations of several SNPs, it's kind of like being shot with a shotgun. The pattern of blast will hit you in different places, and the combination of the blast can really take its effect on a person. So it's not just the individual SNPs, it's the combination of those SNPs and how they work together. One patient I was talking to, and, and uh, I said, you know, you don't have any one single bad SNP, but you have a lot of devastating SNPs. It's like dropping a lot of small bombs on a city in World War II. They were able to, you know, different, both sides of, of the war were able to drop bombs in strategic places and really bring a city to a halt without having an atomic bomb. They had, you know, relatively small bombs that they could use to take out, you know, factories, they could take out bridges, they could take out train railways. And so when these little hits of, of many different SNPs happen in a person, that can affect their mental health and it can affect their brain waves. And so last, with the clinical correlation as emergency, we have to be prepared that people sometimes have heart attacks. They sometimes have uh, seizures that are unannounced and sudden. They can have a hypoglycemic attack. A patient can have a panic attack. A patient can, uh, I mean, my, one of my chiropractic mentors had an elderly lady die on the table before the adjustment. She said hello to the doctors, got up on the, on the, the high-low table, and as the table was descending, the patient just died. And that happens. People die. And it's no, through no cause of the, of the doctor. It's just their time. They could have died chewing their oatmeal in the morning as well as getting a chiropractic adjustment or, um, or having neurofeedback or, or anything. So many, many things can happen and emergencies can happen. We should be prepared for them. Some of my offices have automatic uh, external defibrillators. I think an AED is a great device to have, and it certainly increases the odds of helping someone if they do undergo a, a crisis event. And, um, and certainly um, there should be someone in the building who's trained in um, emergency procedures. Uh, chiropractors are required to have that. I don't know the requirements for psychologists, but it's nice if you're a psychologist to work again. I'm, I'm advocating this, this coherence of, of psychologists and counselors and social workers and marriage and family counselors working together with doctors that are licensed to diagnose the human body, examine the human body, touch the human body, and measure the blood and the saliva and the urine and, and do those physical medicine things. I think it's really useful. Certainly medical doctors can be involved in that realm, and you don't need a crash cart necessarily for a holistic clinic, but it's nice to have a defibrillator. They, they run about $900 to $1,000, and uh, they last a number of years. They can be and must be recharged and, and inspected once a year. And so um, that is the end of Chapter 9, Clinical Correlation.